Hey guys, I'm here at Boston Microgreens and I'm super excited to give you a tour with Oliver Hamburg from Boston Microgreens. So let's get right into it. Hey Oliver. Thanks for having me at uh, Boston Microgreens. I'm super excited to be here. And I'd love to start just kind of hearing how you got started with Boston Microgreens and uh, a little bit of your backstory. Absolutely. Um, Boston Microgreens was a project that came out of a passion for plants. I was growing plants with my roommate. What kind of plants I may not mention in this video. <laughs> but we also had an outdoor space and we were growing you know, vegetables, annuals. Um, I think it was a relationship with that best friend, that roommate, um, that really got us excited about starting a business, you know what I mean? And like two young people looking for business ideas, we stumbled upon microgreens. I think it was a Curtis Stone video on YouTube. Oh, nice. Grow $100,000 of microgreens in your apartment, uh, which did not happen the first year or the second. Uh, um, but that was the initial sort of seed, no pun intended. And, um, you know, microgreens were a crop that we were able to get into with a relatively low barrier of entry, right? All we needed was a couple trays, soil, seeds, racking, and we had tiled floors in our apartment in a sort of sunny area, which was convenient, and uh, a lot of restaurants in our neighborhood, right? So we were able to grow a couple test trays and start going out, and it was at a time where live trays weren't really a thing yet in Boston. Yeah. We actually don't do that many live trays anymore because it's easier for restaurants to be able to just use um, cut packaged yeah. products. Um, but that was sort of the, the beginning, right? It was just um, a good working relationship with someone, um, an interest in plants, and then the opportunities that are that aligned yeah, to for make sure. that possible. That's awesome. That's yeah. great to hear that uh, it came from a passion for, for business and for plants. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of what you need to start a microgreens business and, and get it to the scale that you have here is uh, to have kind of the mix of passion between those two. Because yeah. you, can, you can be a great grower, but if you don't have the, the business sense, it gets real tough when, you know, you got to sell the product, you got to, you got to market it, all that, all that kind of stuff, manage staff, everything that comes along. A lot of moving pieces here because it's basically a light manufacturing business, right? And then you've got this whole branding and sales side. We do all our own distribution oh, nice. as well in Boston. So we deal with, we work with about 50 restaurants and we, a lot of those um, we service twice a week. They're all within like a five mile radius, right? So here we are in the middle of South Boston in a 2,000 square foot basement space um, that was nothing before we got here. I mean, we put in the floor, we put in the plumbing, the electric, the HVAC, um, very much a bootstrapped operation. So we kind of um, built the plane as we were flying it. Oh, we need another engine, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, it was, it was a, a product that really lent itself um, to experimenting and because it's such a high quick turnover right yeah, so yeah. you're able to learn from your mistakes very quickly yeah for and, uh, sure there was uh something that i always think about is you know you think about a tomato farmer they need like many years maybe 20 30 years to perfect their recipe right. you go on microgreens you have a one to two week maybe certain crops three week time frame you can become an expert with microgreens faster than pretty much any other crop, maybe sprouts, but even still, there's not as much intricacy with sprouts as microgreens. So like you can become an expert starting this business from scratch, knowing nothing about microgreens and become an industry expert in like a year or less, which is crazy. And then obviously there's more nuance on that that takes time, but in such a short period of time. I definitely wasn't an expert yeah. in a year, but I can understand how, yeah, there's definitely a, a, a faster rate of learning with, with everything that's happening. Yeah, so for sure. Yeah. So maybe let's walk through the growing process from soil to harvest to disposing of the soil. I'd love to see let's kind do of it. Let's do how it. you guys do things over here. Um, so, I mean, here's a perfect example of our tabula rasa, right? A blank slate. This is Karina. Uh, she does all the seeding uh, at the farm. Um, so we start with our soil. We're using a pro mix right now. Nice. Um, well, maybe we even start with the empty trays, right? So everything in this space, and I don't know if you want to do a little pan, but we're in 2,000 square feet here, right? In the city. And so we need to use our space extremely efficiently. Uh, we like to be in the city because our customers are able to come in, taste their way through the shelves. Yeah. Um, it's good for our team to be able to commute in here. It's... Um, 
but you know, it isn't it isn't a lot of space, right? So everything is very we've I think especially in the last two or three years, and shout out to Tony, our operations um, specialist, um, who has done such a great job in optimizing our workflow, right? Um, so huge. important. Yeah. So we start with our um, our dirty trays. Yeah. They get cleaned at this washing station. Then they come over here to our ergonomic nice. soil filling station. On, on wheels. Of on course. wheels. It has to be. I'll never forget the Christmases that I spent here in this room. Yeah. You know, by myself or with my girlfriend or whatever it was, leaning over a a a 30 gallon bucket or whatever it was filling trays so now we have this um, beautiful system where you get a tray you're able to fill it up with soil right you sweep the soil over the edges right so it's quick and you yeah. don't have to waste then you take these stompers oh, right nice. so we had these custom fabricated oh awesome twenty dollars nice and then we just cluck and then we have our filled trays so these are filled and ready to seed ready to and you can keep them there the soil is dry so you can keep them here for quite a while or? Uh, i don't want to keep them for more than a day or two okay. because um Get you know moved. as 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 you guys probably know with microgreens it's um it's all about pest and pathogen mitigation that's kind of our biggest deal always mold right in yeah. controlled environment agriculture so you don't want a lot of pythium or whatever landing on these trays so, you know, we try to keep the, the turnover okay. relatively um, nice. expeditious. I know it's funny in Canada, we, uh, a lot of farms, uh, there's another brand of trays, but in the States, everyone uses Bootstrap Farmer. Uses and it's really nice to have the colors, though. It's like, you know, this nice visual that you get when you have like all these different colors of trays. Like... I hadn't seen the blue ones yet, and uh, they're actually tickling my fancy. Yeah, these are nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, for testing, for example, if you were doing a batch of testing, you say, okay, pink trays are all testing. Don't touch those. It's good for the team to be able to know what's going on. For sure. Um, for example. Um, so then, you know, we move on to the, the measuring of seeds and the seeding process. Now, this is something that we're still doing by hand. Um, there is obviously lots of expensive equipment that you can invest in for this. Um, but if, I mean, we found that a well-trained hand is pretty effective yeah oh for um, sure and you know karina as you can see is just perfected the craft of, yeah that's 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 about as even as you can really get that's obviously yeah. radish but look she's doing basil right now you yeah. can't even see those seeds when they're yeah they're yeah you really can't see them Está bien, but you got you got the technique down yeah que lo haces muy bien <laughs> um you know, yeah. all of our seeds are pre-measured. Then we've got, you know, we've got our labels. Um, oh, nice. Variety and date, right? Yeah. That's pretty simple. So all of those are done beforehand. And so then that kind of facilitates a smooth seeding process. Our seeds are kept in, um, you know, relatively airtight, relatively light-proof yeah. um, containers. And then we have a whole storage cabinet in the back. So this is kind of just like active seeding. Yeah. We grow over 70 varieties wow. of microgreens. Wow. That's crazy. We know how to grow about 120. Wow. Uh, would not recommend. Yeah. <laughs> um, because, you know, there's so much variability that it's still so hard to control. Yeah. Um, seed lots. I'm sure we've all experienced this, especially since the pandemic. Um, RIP Kitazawa Seed. Kitazawa oh, family really? seed company out of Oakland, California that just got acquired by... Um, those who shall not be named, wow. but I'm not very happy with our oh, main seed no. supplier right now. Oh, wow. that's um, disappointing. Because I, probably, I know who, there's one or two companies I know probably. <laughs> you know yeah. I'm talking yeah. to you guys. Yeah. Um, they're just, I mean, A, the customer service isn't great. And we're not going to talk about how bad things here. But, you know, it, it was so good to be able to have a um, reliable business relationship. Yeah. And when that went away and suddenly bad seeds started coming in and we weren't even compensated for that, that's that's not nice so what we do now in order to somewhat um safeguard ourselves is we have a huge chest freezer and i've got like eight months of shiso seed in here wow because i never want to run out of basil or shiso seed again yeah. you know what i mean i know exactly what you mean we do the same thing with sunflower you get a good lot we bought a year supply exactly yeah um, and you know some seeds are more and so that's the thing with the seeds and the soil right like there's so much variability yeah. so if you're growing 70 varieties um that can get really tricky. Yeah, you know that's I mean? like a whole job in its own. Yeah, yeah. So what we do here is everything is grown to order. So chefs, uh, and we do all our own distribution, right? Which means we 
are literally seed to table or seed to walk in cooler at least. Um, we develop relationship with restaurants. We um, learn about the chefs. We learn about the menu. We develop um, a standing order. So yeah. we're delivering the same product to the same restaurants every week seasonally and then they, they might change it to a couple different products. And then it goes into production. Um, we developed our own software um, that we use in-house to basically, it's a glorified seed, seeding calculator, right? But it's telling us what we need to seed, what we need to harvest, what we need to mix together. And it keeps that all nice and tidy without the, you know, a 50 page Excel sheet, which I also have as a backup in case because, and shout out to all the student programmers who helped me build that oh, four amazing. or five years ago. We actually wanted to put that into production as a, a software as a service. Um, but my partner in that had a baby and then another baby and it ended up being more of a project that, uh, than we thought it was going to be. So thankfully, Vertigro is doing some good work and hopefully we're going to have um, a reliable um, service soon that's going to allow microgreen farmers all over the world to oh, yeah. manage their farms, right? Because sure. what do farmers want to do? Farm, yeah. not do, you know, everything manage else. Excel sheets, yeah. right? Um, so everything is grown to order and so we have all these different products. So. You know, we might be growing, I don't know, depends on the season, right? Yeah. Anywhere from 40 to 50 different products. Yeah. What is this? What is this? This one's anise hyssop. Oh, interesting. I have never seen this before. Let's try some. It's very soft. Oh, it's very licorice-y. Yeah. That's really good, though. You know, it, it, it's, it's susceptible to a little bit of this yellowing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I wonder we, if that's a watering issue but it's not consistent from tray tray or maybe a seed density could well, be we're, we're seeing that they're not competing you can see even with some of these denser areas um you know something interesting that we've encountered is nitrogen lock due to calcium in uh, an availability of calcium in 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 substrate or in interesting uh, yeah interesting i mean plants are complicated right yeah. there's so much nuance that goes into yeah. it that's also the thing with growing so many varieties being on top of so many different things and then seasons change. And obviously we have, you know, a lot of dehumidification and conditioning, but that only does so much in an area like New England and Boston, where we have very hot, humid summers, very dry, cold winters. Yeah. And we were in a basement. Um, so we were getting some passive heating and cooling from the brick and the stone around us, but that only does so much, of course. Yeah. Here's another one of my very favorite varieties. <laughs> oh, this is fennel. This is the bronze fennel. Wow. I mean, this is just a gorgeous. I haven't grown this in a gorgeous specimen. Probably <coughs> what feels like ten years. Mm. I mean, and I don't even know. Let's see if we can try it. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. It's like a piece of art. I don't even know if this is technically a microgreen anymore. We grow a lot of our to true leaf varietals to true leaf because yeah. that's what we find. Chefs want, um, ignore this lemon bomb, Godzilla lemon bomb. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who this is for, but. Um, that's full size. That's, that's, yeah, that's yeah. a full leaf herb yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, well, maybe you'll get into baby greens. Who knows? You know, a lot of chefs have been asking for I know. baby greens. And herbs. I mean, hydroponic herbs or some kind of hybrid with soil, so you get a little bit of microbiology yeah. lending to the flavor of the, oh, the crop. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could be a big deal. Look at how big our basil is. I yeah, mean, yeah. This is one of the, that's one of the smaller ones that mm -hmm. was in there, right? Yeah. So a lot of our chefs prefer a nice, larger size, big, a generous basil leaf. Mm -hmm. What? Um, a lot of growers grow for yield and stem length gets really long. Yeah. But that's one of the cool things is we have those direct relationships with our customers. So we hear very quickly, oh, you know, that cilantro stem is too long. Let's, yeah. let's see what we can do about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it helps you be a better grower too because you end up growing what people actually want. Whereas if you're selling direct to consumer, they, they may not even know what is a good microgreen. So it helps you by having customers like that, even though it can be a pain or more work, it yeah. makes you a better grower and you learn from it and learn what the market actually wants. And then it's easier when you go to the next person because they may not say something, and th but they want that same stem length or that same quality or flavor or whatever it is that they're looking for. And you can use that as a way to grow the best product you can for those customers. Spot, spot on. So yeah. It's always one of the balances in business is um, how much convenience and um, variety or customizability do I offer my customer and how does that balance against my 
productivity and efficiency as a business, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and in that design thinking process, we always, and that's probably why I grow so many slash too many varieties, we always wanted to be able to offer a very high quality product and service to yeah. our customers. Yeah. This is one of my favorite varietals. That's the Thai basil. Ooh, yeah. I just love that so much. Yeah. So you can get it to focus. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so... Um, it's so hard to find Thai basil in grocery stores, but for that cuisine, it's like essential, you know? And it's very tender, right? Yeah. Which, the shelf life is... Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay, so we've got our our seeded trays, right? Yeah. Um, you guys know what's next. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bump your head on the dehumidifier. <laughs> um, germination. Oh, nice. Okay. This is a pretty ger empty germination area right now. Um, mm, it's nice and windy. I, um, I feel like I'm on board the, the SS Boston Microgreen. Um, germination is obviously very important. Um, every part of the microgreen step is important, right? Because yeah. it can go wrong. Um, everything needs to work. Otherwise, you end up with know, holes in your trays or whatever it is. Yeah, for um, sure. We've got different areas. So we've got light germination. Seeds that need direct light in order to germinate. That's um, these guys? That's these guys. Okay. Then we've got, this light comes on for 12 hours a day. Oh, okay. Interesting. Then so what, what crops are those that need the light to germinate? I don't want to say. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll cut that. Okay. Maybe you can offer that in your consulting yeah. package. Um, <laughs> then we've got indirect light. So this is what I'll say. If you're having, this is what I'll, this is what I'll say. If you're having problems with varieties that are not, sprouting properly you sometimes need to give them direct light but what happens if they stayed under direct light they would be this tall yeah, right? because exactly. they would just you know they would have everything they needed yeah so then they need to come into indirect light to stretch mm. and then they can come out onto got the it okay okay now i get it so okay. that's like a direct light blackout or direct light indirect light yeah and then yeah. of course you have trays that are just and i we have actually right now there's nothing i guess it all oh there's a couple of things behind you there oh these ones um, are stacked here yeah. These guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, then you just have your standard stack up to eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight would be yeah. the maximum. Um, What's the longest germination time? Seven days. Wow. Seven days. And the shortest is probably two? Two. Okay. Nice. You run the risk, of course, with a tray that's germinating, germinating and it's stacked that... Um, Necesitas algo? You run the risk, of course, with a tray that's stacked for seven days without airflow that potential uh, opportunistic contaminants, yeah. we'll call them, are able to colonize, right? Yeah, um, for sure. So, for example, with the cilantro, and I have to give some credit to Dave up at Micro Acres. Um, he helped us develop, and then we further developed a, a really robust method for germinating cilantro nice. where um, there's top watering going on there's a little bit of bottom watering but we're basically trying to reduce the days in germination um, encourage root growth because what happens if roots are able and this is really Dave saved us here if roots are able to um, penetrate down into this bottom tray they're able to absorb a lot of the water so the water is going to be stagnant in that substrate during germination mm. a lot of little things yeah happen. some yeah. I mean pea shoots radish Forget about it. They're, Set it and forget yeah, it, yeah, right? But a lot of sure. things are a little bit more finicky. Yeah, um, yeah. So One I thing mean, I found with cilantro is using monogerm seed makes a huge difference. Instead of this leisure split? Yeah. So so it's a split seed. So cilantro is the whole seed. Oh, so yes. Okay, the, the, split the, the split seed. Yeah, yeah. because the whole seed is two it, it just, organisms, it just doesn't, right? Yeah, it's, it's, two, it's literally two seeds in one. In one. What a, what a weird kind Funny of... Funny how I know, nature, yeah, how well, nature works Well, did you know that, that a beet seed is up to five or yeah, six? Yeah, I knew it was multiple. I didn't know it was that much. So that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I mean, like, I, it's things like that. I wonder why did nature do that? You know, it's like, it, it's just such an unusual thing. Almost every seed is one seed, like fruits, nuts, yeah. like annuals, almost all one seed. But then you have yeah. these few variants. And I wonder what the advantage... For them in nature was to have multiple seeds in one seed and obviously that is you know 
that's like that for a reason. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, because yeah. evolutionarily, that was an advantage for that for that organism somehow. Yeah, I'm sure we could spend a lot of time. Oh time yeah, <laughs> talking yeah, that about getting that. into. But in the meantime, I will <laughs> prevail you with uh, just a gorgeously germinated oh, tray nice. of, of red shiso. Wow, um, that looks great. And this is kind of really what does it for me as a grower. I see this, I see healthy plants, and my my heart chakra is just like, boom, you know what I mean? Yeah. It just like, it does something for me. It really, really gets me going. Um, you know, obviously radish like a, is yeah. just fun to, to you know. Yeah, yeah. You can always fall back on a trusty tray of radish. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And then those shiso trays turn into something gorgeous yeah, like great. this, right? Yeah. Like, they look really great. Yeah. Shiso is an interesting crop because it requires a certain daily light index, like cannabis, um, in order to achieve its color, yeah. right? And so you're dealing with a couple different variables, grow days, nutrients, um, hours of light per day, but say you were able, you, say you applied um, a, a hefty amount of nitrogen to this, and you were able to get the leaf size to get larger by, uh, in, a, in a shorter amount of, or say by the same amount of days, it would be much larger. Yeah. It would grow, but it wouldn't be red enough. Yeah. So you actually need to slow the growth time down a little bit or increase the hours per day or the intensity of the light. Yeah. Because it's the light that triggers whatever um, chemical process in the plant that, that brings that color up. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. So very interesting, right? Yeah. Always... And also spe spectrum can sometimes do it too. Oh, like there, yeah, there used to sense. be, a, there's a lot of test, like a testing I did back in the day when I started with LEDs. And um, you have you put the right ratio of blue and red light, you can get the colors like in lettuce too, just a pop, like like make it like a dark dark purple if yeah. it's like a purple lettuce, and you just give it a regular light, it'll have just a hue of it. So it's crazy how plants respond to light intensity and spectrum. I would love to test that a little bit, and yeah. I have to give a huge shout shout out to Martin, um, and also to Karina for putting so much attention to detail into these trays. Yeah, because this you can see it right now is my perfect shiso tray. I come here, I see this rack of shiso. Not only am I extremely satisfied or, or, or fulfilled as a grower and as just like another um, organism and, and, and life being interacting with this healthy with these healthy plants, but I also see little dollar signs, bing, bing, yeah. bing, you know what I mean? Above every tray, it's yeah. like in The Sims, you know, or in the yeah. Farmville when you see the little, the little, yeah. cause that, that shiso is, is hard to make money with. Um, if it's inconsistent, yeah, and if you're getting less than two ounces a tray, you know what I mean. It's it's, like, it gets really tough. Yeah, you know? for even sure. Even though it sells for ninety dollars a pound. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this, this is uh, I have That's to a thank. Beautiful tray. I have to thank the team. Yeah. Um, Just a perfectly full tray, and at, and exactly the right size. Yeah. Right? Yeah. For sure. So thank you, thank you, Martin. Um, and thank you, everyone here. I mean. Um, I sold a large part of this company last year and after six years of just like, you know, like I said, you know, missing holidays with my family and just, I mean, it was great. It was great to be able to wear all these hats and build something that I'm really proud of. Yeah. Um, and then when I, um, when I sold, I transitioned away a little bit just to get a little bit of space, mental space from that, right? Yeah. Because it would have been easy for me to just continue. And this team, Bennett, Martin, Karina, Hugo, Tony, I mean, they have just like, in no particular order there, by the way, um, they have just been so amazing. I can't come in on a Saturday. Tony is there. I'm like, Tony, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, yeah, we had to figure something out. And so I'm here like making up the work. I didn't get a call. I they they don't. There's no like, boss. Can I get overtime? Like they manage it within themselves. Yeah. They're accountable. They believe in what we're doing here. They believe in the product. I genuinely think that they're happy to come to work. Yeah. Some days are like, oh shit, I gotta be you know in the in the at the farm again. But genuinely, I I feel like so much gratitude for the way that they're showing up and the way that they've been able to just manage this business. Yeah. Right. Like they. The team manages this business, so I just, if this is, could be even a, a PSA or a message for growers out there building their companies, um, even at a small scale, we're talking 2,000 square feet, ju just around 500,000 in revenue a year, right? Yeah. And that can be a self-sufficient, totally self-sufficient business. Yeah. 
You said five thousand dollars a year. Five hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred thousand dollars a year. Got it. Got it. As you said, five thousand. I was like, this is five thousand dollars right yeah, here like, in this rack. Like, That's impressive. You got you got some. Some great margins on on the product, yeah. No, for sure, I totally get it. And I think that's what a lot of people strive to to work towards is having a system like this, having, and not just with the production, but with the team, I think is so, so important to have a team that's passionate, that loves what they do, wants to come in on the weekend when something goes wrong, and is grateful to be at work every day doing something they actually love, which, you know, I think is, is so important and so valuable for, for, you know, to pass on to the next generation is how, like, you know, you should not do what just because someone says for you to, you know, go get a corporate job, like find what you love and do that. And it'll just spread more Absolutely. goodness in the world and to the next generation to see that this can be done. You don't need a lot of money to start. You can have a dream business or, or whatever it is and you can do it. And I think that's like, you know, really inspiring to see how your team has taken so much initiative and, you know, see when I first got here, how they were like, they were working hard, you know, like they're, they, I can, I could feel their energy and their passion for what they do. And I think that's so, so important in having a team and not just to, for the, for you to make your life easier, but also for the plants to have people that want to be around them and to have that kind of energy in the space around you. 99% of all atoms. That's empty space. Yeah. And the rest of it is just vibrating strings. Like yeah. how is the energy not going to effect? Yeah. We have a really cool project that kind of um, was born out of Boston Microgreens. We go into um, schools here in Boston, in the inner city, and we set up vertical farms just like this, pretty rudimentary in classrooms. And we teach kids about growing um, awesome. plants. We, and it's uh, about you know, environmental sustainability. It's about nutrition. But one of the, just to touch on what you just said, one of the biggest key points that we tried to like, leave with these kids, with our students, is find something that you really like get really good at it you know yeah and with that you i mean you have no idea how valuable you're going to be in this modern economy yeah we need people that are engaged that are passionate and that have skills you yeah. know what i mean i totally agree and and this was i'm just so grateful that we we were able to tap into something that hit a lot of those boxes and we were able to create this this wonderful business model that's amazing that's really amazing yeah yeah so back to production i, I feel like we could talk for probably we years probably about could. this um, about should. all the all the, the energy and and you know the the teams like you know the team function and how to build that, but in terms of production, the watering system you have yeah. is very unique. I've never seen this anywhere else. So I'd love to hear. It seems like you have a, a semi automated system, and I'd love to hear more how you created this and and how it works and yeah and why you chose this this route. So once again, I have to give my credit to to um, in this case, uh, I believe his name is John. Uh, up at Dowie, Dowie or Dowie Farms, sorry, John, if I got that wrong, up in New Hampshire, uh, who's actually a direct competitor of mine now, and it's always fun to see him in the restaurants <laughs> or see his product. Um, he was making YouTube videos back in the day, and I saw something similar to this. It's a, a, it's a basic ebb and flow system where we have a bottom reservoir, right? Yeah. Um, and it's pumping water into these flood tables. So these flood tables are molded in a way where the water comes in and at level, the water will always drain back. This mm. is, there's a slight incline to this um, bulkhead at the end here. Yeah. Right? And so basically what we do is like up on whatever our interval is, once a day, once every two days, it's not actually that often, we pump the water in and I can individually control these bays. Uh, we pump the water in, it sits there for like, what, 30 seconds, and then it gets released back down into the reservoir. So we're saving a lot of that water by recirculating it. Yeah. We were actually the first farm in the United States, according to my inspectional services agent, that got this design cleared with the FDA. Wow. Because, you know, they came in here, they didn't know what the heck they were looking at, right? So we had to go all the way up the chain, and uh, obviously the produce safety rule is the, the, the federal guidelines that um, farms like this are our purview to, um, and I don't know if that was the correct syntax, but the produce safety rule is, is our, are our guidelines. Yeah. And um, so we had to figure that all out, right? Um, this used to be completely automated. And now you notice, huh. look at this. There's an, yeah, there's, there's yeah. a, there's an empty, empty bulkhead. Empty bulkhead. Yeah. Hmm. hmm, Jonah, I wonder why. Um, 
dreams of automation, right? Automation is great, right? And especially at a certain scale, automation yeah. makes so much sense. Yeah. We noticed that we weren't able to get the timing because it used to be uh, the pumps were on like an irrigation timer yeah. uh, or, or a Raspberry Pi, Arduino, whatever you want to do. And then the there used to be uh, solenoid valves that used to open that would release the water, right? Yeah. So we'd pump it in and pump it out. One of the problems is that we were only able to do it in minute segments. Yeah. So maybe seconds would have been easier, but even just the level. And so what we noticed is that because conditions aren't perfect, there was still a little bit of variety happening. For mm. example, the tray on one side would get more water than the tray on the other side, or one side of it, or a one week older tray of shiso is going to absorb more water or less water, right? Yeah. Than, 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 a, than a shiso tray of a different age. So the attention that the trays need from the farm justified actually doing this semi automatically. Again, someone has to be at the farm every day anyway to deal with germ and spray these germ trays. Yeah. The, especially the ones in direct light. Yeah. So it just, okay, fine. You might as well spend a half an hour. It takes a half an hour to water a thousand trays. Might as well just give them the attention that they deserve. Yeah. It ends up being a better uh, workflow, or, or rather, we end up having less crop failure, less overwatering, less underwatering. Now, I'm not saying that that is like a rule of thumb. Um, that was just our experience. Yeah. I'm sure that automation can be done in a way where it works perfectly, right? But that was a funny story where I have a massive tote full of $45 solenoid valves that basically just got given away because it made more sense for us not to have them. Right? Yeah, no, there's so many factors that play with things like this is like, what soil are you using? What is the, you know, how, how long can it take till the solenoid actually can drain out? Because right. like at, our, at, at, you know, Living Earth, we would water for an hour, two hours, and it would sit in water the whole time. But we were using a certified organic soil that didn't absorb water as well. So right. there's things like that. There's so many factors at play that determine yeah. what will work. Um, but I'm got, like, it, it, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting story that you guys had it automated, but it wasn't working well. So you took a step back and now you have a system that's semi-automated, which still saves a lot of time. You're not watering each tray one at a time. And by doing that, uh, you're, fi you're finding the balance between automation. And that, that's a big factor. And I think why a lot of the really big farms yeah. have been not doing well or failing is because they, they spent too much time trying to perfect a system with automation and they didn't focus on, on the sales. So if they just did a semi-automated system, they would have a profitable farm like Boston Microgreens instead of a farm that is now in bankruptcy and you know can't operate anymore, can't feed people and can't do the good work that you know they were intended to do. Yeah. It's very interesting to be in this industry right now where people and you know a lot of investor money, they build a golden temple, a golden cage, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Right. Um, you're growing produce, right? And that, that, that was, and it's always an interesting balance, right? Because um, we have a great market here in Boston. We have, I mean, I'm really grateful for all our, our clients too. They got us through the pandemic. Like September of 2020, they were like, Oliver, get in here. We'll put you on takeout, right? Oh, nice. Um, That's awesome. But, but, you know, sales and then, oh, production. Oh, sales. Oh, production, right? You're wearing so many hats. Yeah. Um, especially, well, if you're doing your own distribution which I wouldn't want it any other way because our margins are, are really nice that way. And yeah. also we get to, that was always the best part for me. That's what I was actually doing all morning. It's just like out, out with the chefs, walking into kitchens, developing relationships. You see the tangible sort of end result of your product and it's, it's really fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? Very satisfying. Very satisfying. Very fulfilling. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's work that, I, the more farms I speak to, the more I see how valuable that is for them. Yeah. Uh, my approach was more distribution approach, yeah. but like, you know, you gotta love what you do. And I think a lot of farms love having that relationship with chefs or just, or, you know, whoever it is with, with retail stores. Cause you, you miss that when, once you get to a certain scale, you kind of, you can lose that. And so you sell through distributors, you sell, you know, not direct to consumer anymore. You lose that intimate connection with who's actually consuming your food. And I think for a lot of farms, from my experience doing the podcast for the last you know, two months, is that farms and the people who run them really love that part of the business. And it's just very interesting from my perspective because I, I wasn't, I was more about the growing the best food. Mm -hmm. uh, but most, most farmers I speak to is about the, the relationship with the people that are using the food in whatever capacity it is, which is really awesome because it's building that community in your local area and making sure that the customers are happy. And it's a, it's a very 
customer centric business model rather than just focusing on production. Yeah. I mean, you just said something very interesting, and that's, and I think I may be paraphrasing, but the business has to work for you. You have to love what you do. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And there, there's, and for everyone, that's going to be different, and there's going to be a different nuances and the balance of like how that works out. Yeah. Um, but I would, because working with distributors makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Boom, efficiency, you harvest those trays. Here you go. Here's a thousand clamshells. Yeah. You know, Baldor, Sid Wayner, whoever it is, that's those are the people in our area, right? Um, so either works and, and you still have that part where you're growing healthy plants and you're getting that, you know, that yeah. feeling. Um, so it's, I would say that that's something that is going to be different for everyone, but that you should really think about in, and, 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 you know, what, one thing that we did and I'm grateful, we were, we've been very successful and very lucky. Um, we, I'm, you know, I'm a triple fire Aries, sort of like, let's ram our head through the door before checking if the door handle is open, right? That's how I built this company. Um, but a little bit of more foresight would have been also useful in planning and kind of like, okay, what's my five-year vision here? Like, yeah. where do I want to be? How do we work towards that goal? Instead of just like, you know, let's grow the best quality we can. Let's develop these relationships and let's just sell, sell, sell and, and grow, 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 yeah. which worked. And you really need that because I think a lot of people spend too much time planning, yeah. way too much time, and they spend their whole lives planning and nothing ever gets done. I see that everywhere. Um, so again, balance, and that's for your personality type. But again, back to your point, do you know it's got to work for you, and and you've you've got to like it. Just try to be aware of how all these different pieces are, are yeah. coming together. And and you know one thing that I wish I did earlier on was hire people to do the things that you don't like doing. It's it, you know, wow. like if, if you can if you can uh, afford to do that, that's a great way to, to run a business, but also still enjoy your life. So it can be anything from creating SOPs. If people find Excel sheets boring, hire someone to do that and focus on the things you want. Some people love sales, but don't really want to do production. So you know, hire staff to do production and then work on the sales and just do the things you love is so important in running a business. And you often people get lost like, oh, this is what I have to do because this is what I learned in school or this is what people told me I have to do. But it's just a much better model to do the things you actually want to do in business and pay people to do the things you don't want to do. Because I've learned in my experience, there's tons of people that actually like taking compost out and putting in the compost in the back. I didn't like it. And I had people that, you know, some people liked it, some people don't. So you learn that everyone's different and there's people that would be happy very happy to get paid to do something you don't want to do. Yeah. And then there's people that, and vice versa, that would hate to do sales. And if you love doing sales, then you should focus on that. And obviously right. you have to learn the skill sets to run a business, but do your best to focus on the things you love and use the things that you don't love as a way to get over the discomfort of not doing something you love and grow as a human being doing it that way. But maybe not in the long run, do something that you, you hate because then you might as well just get a job at that point. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of people that have jobs that they love and there's a lot of people that have jobs that they don't love. You just said something interesting, which is that if you can afford it, even if you can't afford it. And I know we talked about a little bit about um, borrowing money. Um, I borrowed $20,000 um, from my parents when I started this, this business. And then we were cash flow positive month two. Um, I know other farms that have invested a million dollars, right? Um, but if you're going to take your business seriously, and this is something I t tell my consulting clients, you know, think about this logically, right? Like think about, again, think about where you want to be, how much that's going to cost. Um, if you try to do everything yourself, it may take you a lot longer to get there. If I had borrowed $100,000 or $200,000 and I could have just set up the perfect facility, I would have gotten to the point where I was able to you know, get that million dollar valuation or whatever within three years instead of five and a half, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so borrowing, leveraging, I mean, that's the way the entire modern economy works, right? Yeah. You can go put 10, 20% down on a multifamily property and suddenly other people are buying a building for you, right? Yeah. Leverage. Leverage, um, yeah. So that's, that's important to consider and whether that fits into your model. Yeah, no, it's a good point. With, with leverage comes risk, but yeah. when you're talking about like, you know, relatively small amount of money and it can pay for itself pretty fast, which is one thing that's really great about microgreens is yeah. you can take out a loan for, let's say, 
a hundred thousand dollars hypothetically yeah. and make that money back in like you know if you do it right in like four months you can just hire people like oliver or or me and have them like tell you everything that you should do to set up your farm you know even and you're right in a way if even if you don't have the, the necessarily the funds to do it you can still make that money back really fast so i'm glad you said that i would have loved to have a jonah when i was starting this business in 2017 yeah to someone to tell me and yeah it's a, it's an investment yeah but someone to tell me all of these things this is what this works this doesn't work think about these things consider that that saves you a year of your life and a lot of money in the and long time run. and time that valuable time that you can grow the business a lot faster if you choose to do it's, so it's a it's a no-brainer yeah. and um i've found that you know everyone that i have worked with has has been really happy with with that advice and um yeah. yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Yeah, no, for sure. I, I wish more, like I was in the same mindset when I started where I was like, oh, I'm just going to do everything myself. Me too. You know, and, and, and I feel like a lot of business owners are in that mindset when they start out. because like, I want, like, it's partially pride, but it's partially also like, you know, just trying to save you as much money. save money. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. But sit, what I've learned in business is often saving money ends up costing you more money. Things like seed, consulting, buying the, the like the lowest cost, equipment or lights or whatever can often cost you a lot more than it will save you and i th i think if, if there's any takeaway from this tour is is spend the money on things that will actually grow your business investing in yourself and your own education is probably the most powerful thing to transform you and your business whether it's personal or business development and people should be spending a lot more money on that and my personal opinion maybe a little bit less on universities and that kind of education but that's just my opinion and, and spend more of that money on actually growing yourself or your business. And then you'll be able to make better decisions and make better investments in yourself and in the, your business and whatever it may be. Yeah. 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 Um, and then so from getting back to the actual <laughs> tour. Um, so once they're grown to full size. Yes. What, what is the next step? So they grow to full size and I'll let you get this shot down this green corridor. Um, then it's time to harvest the greens, right? So uh, we would take a tray, for example, and we have these nice big rolling racks that we yeah. stack it up with 30 trays or whatever. Always and has then to it be comes on over into our harvesting station. Now, as I mentioned, we need to be extremely efficient with our space. Here's our little, our little workstation nice. um, where we have our you know, computer and our systems running. So we have uh, these two tables as well as another table that comes out for harvest. And... Um, we harvest everything by hand with scissors. Nice. Uh, sorry, with knives. knives. Not with scissors. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stainless steel paring knives. Paring knives? Paring Interesting. knives. Oh, okay, the yeah. long ones here. I'll the show ones you. that are, they kind of have a curve to it. By no, the way, no. I, lo I love the pull up bar here. Uh, I think or maybe that's this genius. is a, Sorry? The pull up bar. Oh, yeah. Well, genius. you got to stay fit yeah, at the farm, yeah. right? <laughs> this actually might. Is it a fillet knife or a paring knife? Well, anyway, this kind of knife, yeah. right? It's long. Um, What's also nice about this, besides being able to get nice angles and cuts, is that you have more sharp blade, right? So when this gets dull, then you start using the middle, then you start using the oh, end. Oh, interesting. You need to be sharpening your knives like two, three times each harvest. Wow. So we're doing what, like 500 trays in a harvest or whatever. Um, you need to be sharpening the knife. And we have, let's say, four people on a, on a team starts at eight. They go till 11. So they're, they're efficient. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, you know... Keeping everything clean, obviously super important. Stainless steel, super important. Yeah. Sharpening these knives, because I can just like lightly press against that stem and it's gonna cut through very clean instead of ripping out the, the, yeah, the stem yeah. and the root. Um, then it creates more work too if you have to take the roots out of after. It's, oh my it's God, just, I mean, yeah. you don't want dirt in your process. Yeah. No brainer. Everyone is familiar with these bad boys, um, industrial standards, so we've got scales. And we've got big stainless steel sort of mixing bowls. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, so there's, you know, there's a there's a process for all of this. Yeah. We're harvesting into bowls, um, you know, by variety, and then those are either getting packaged straight away and put in cooling, or mixed with other varieties for our mixes, put in cooling. Um, it's pretty simple. We've got these nifty little labels. Wow. Um, and those just, you know, get slapped on our clamshells. We use. Um, Packaging that's made from corn. Oh, nice. So it's um, facility compostable. You can't just chuck it in your garden, but yeah. at a composting facility, it'll compost. Even if it ends up in a landfill, it'll be gone in five years instead of a thousand, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so it's not even that much more expensive. It's a commitment we want to make to try to be as holistic as possible. All the power at this farm is renewable energy. Oh, that's awesome. Um, because Massachusetts um, allows you to shop between different uh, energy vendors. Uh, so that's, that's another yeah. commitment. And then, um, you know, all of our soil. So this is really fun. So after we're done harvesting, and we can come back to the harvest process, all of this gold... Yeah. I mean, this is gold. Yeah, Come on, talk to me about like resources. Like, it would be such a shame to throw this stuff out. So, it goes to community gardens all around the city. Nice. And when we can't find those, because they fill up pretty quickly, I yeah, mean, this is what, this, look at this. Tracier. This is one harvest. Yeah. Like, yeah. look at this, right? Um, there's two, <laughs> two layers yeah. there. Um, well, it'll go to a landscaping company. Okay, nice. Oh, yeah. that's good. So, instead okay. of paying, $300 a pickup for a trash company to come and pick it up and have to have barrels and space and whatever yeah. outside. Um, you know, our, we put it in our delivery van and it goes there. And so let's say I pay someone 25 an hour and it takes them an hour to go back and forth. Let's say there's two guys just to make it easier to lift. So that's $50 to dispose of the entire harvest of soil instead yeah. of 300, right? And it's going to a better for sure. But it, it lives on, right? Yeah, no, for sure. That, that was one thing that I, I was so against having the soil. Oh, nice. <laughs> I was so against having the soil end up in a landfill because yeah. we, we were going through like boatloads of soil, you know? Yeah. And uh, we were lucky we found a company that is, they, they do garbage disposal, but they also own a soil company. So we were able to get big dumpster bins and put the soil in there. They would pick it up, compost it, and then resell it as like potting soil or gardening soil yeah. and amend either amend other soil or grow it on its, or sell it as own as a potting soil, which I thought was pretty cool. Beautiful. So yeah, like I feel like it's, it's almost necessary because that, like you said, that stuff is really black gold. Yeah. You put that in a garden, it's going to make you a huge difference. You should see yeah. my crops at home. So we have this, this garden, my neighbor has like an empty lot. So we turn it into this permaculture garden, built these big raised beds. First two years of our soil went straight in there. And I, you know, I still haven't really amended it. I throw leaves on there once in the fall, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, all those stems and those roots and the seeds or whatever, it's it's it breaks down. It's yeah. it breaks down and it's organic material. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah. And then and then depending on where it's if it's if it's not fully composted, you'll get some crops coming up. But having said that, your weeds are going to be cilantro yeah, exactly. and beet and yeah. radish, right? So yeah. that's that's it's, fun. It's, it's all they're we they're technically weeds, but they're not weeds in the traditional sense because they're edible and um yeah my uh, i used to put the compost way back when in my brother's garden yeah. and he hates cilantro and i remember i gave him a bunch Sorry. of cilantro <laughs> trays and he was not happy about that but i, I it was great because i just was able to harvest some cilantro and uh um yeah and, and it's great in your garden so we, we grew in the same soil we grew uh, a non-spicy habanero. So I had the flavor of a habanero, an orange habanero, okay. but it wasn't spicy. We got it from Baker Creek Seed and just like a fun kind of project in the summer outside of the farm. We grew it in the yeah. same soil we grew. We got from one plant. It was like 230 something peppers. So cool. Yeah. And then we had a counter going on how many peppers we harvested from this plant because it was insane from one pepper plant. That that's just speaks to the quality of the soil that's used for microgreens. And it's really valuable asset that shouldn't just be disposed of it should be reused in some capacity and we could nerd out for a long time about soil microbiology yeah all the research that's going on right now uh, what we're discovering about soil food networks and how plants actually spend most of their energy right so they break carbons off of co2 in photosynthesis those carbon that's that they turn into sugars right yeah. and they spend most of those sugars actually secreting hormones into the ground that they use to communicate with um, fungi, bacteria, this whole, um, this whole ecosystem that lives down there. So say the plant needs calcium, it'll send a signal to this fungi. Um, fungi are miners, right? It'll go over to the calcium that's mineralized, that isn't plant available, break it down, bring it back to the plant. A bacteria literally, and this is like newly discovered, will enter the root hair of a plant, the root of the plant will um, take apart the membrane, it will reprogram the RNA of this bacteria, reassemble the bacteria, and then send it back out to go forage for what it needs, right? That's So crazy. what's happening in soil, I think soil health is something that can be a huge part of solving our food security and climate problems. 70% of our fresh water 
is going into agriculture. And I mean, we're Korean natural farming, Japanese natural farming, and just building soil. I want everyone who has any kind of inkling here to look into this because it has the potential to not only um, save all that water, but we do not need to be putting, we do not need to be, um, pretty much don't need to be fertilizing our soil, right? Some dry amendments, whatever, but they're very natural. Yeah. And then you create the microbial life that is able to turn those amendments and what's already there, just rocks, into plant available nutrition. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think the the whole industrial farming has gone way too far to one end. It's destroying the soil. Once you don't have the topsoil, it's very hard to sustain you know, life as we know it without that topsoil. And, and people don't realize how important it really is. It's so important. I mean, and it's understandable, right? Industrial revolution, people are moving to cities. We need to sustain large populations in urban centers. We start growing. World War II ends. We have all these factories that were producing chemical weapons that are now producing fertilizers and pesticides, right? I mean, you know, we, we know how the economy does its little tango. Um, and, you know, then they start using it. And of course, in the beginning, you have all the microbial life that's supporting our farming, yeah. as well as the chelated salt nutrients. It works really well for about five or 10 years. Then the microbes die, and then you have the dust bowl. Yeah. Right? Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, it, it's so important. And, and that there's, um, I, there's so much research going on. And I always tell people that, like, it's, it's hard to fully understand and appreciate what's in soil. But as time goes on, people will most definitely understand and appreciate it more and realize how valuable of an asset it is to human beings and to like our ability to feed ourselves because it's it, it's just so so important and so vital and growing good soil which is often what really good farmers do is they don't necessarily grow plants they grow really good soil and from the soil the plants can sustain themselves because when plants are able to take advantage of this relationship and feed themselves a la carte right from yeah. the soil taking, oh, today I need boron, iron, and zinc, and they get that, they're able to fulfill their genetic potential, right? They're able, a tomato actually tastes like something. Yeah. And so this is what we're learning now is that you can harness four billion years of evolution and, and intelligence in the soil systems to build soil, to grow healthy crops. Yeah. So a farmer is able to not just use less inputs and save money, but get more yield of a higher quality, right? Yeah. I mean, you think, you look up at the stars and you think that's insane. You look into a teaspoon of soil and you can trip out on the billions of interactions that are happening right there, right? Yeah. So it's, 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 like a, it's beautiful. It, it's a whole different world that I'm excited for humanity to kind of discover more. Yeah. And the more it's discovered, the more appreciation. It's just right now, I feel that the system is working well enough but the quality of the food and the level of nutrition of food, you have to eat more and more of the food to get these nutrients. Whereas, you know, eating foods like microgreens that are grown in a high quality soil will allow you to eat, you get more nutrients with less food and you'll feel more satiated eating foods like that. So, and, and also in generally foods that are grown in proper soil will actually taste better. So like the, the sugar content of a tomato will be much higher if it's grown in a high quality soil than if it's grown in, you know, a, a traditional industrial system. And one thing that's really cool is, is hydroponics is very resource efficient, but it yes. doesn't produce very high quality food. Correct. So I, I'm excited to see that combination take fold as time goes on. We understand more about the soil science. We can add those things in to hydroponics and get it to, to be at more of a point where we can feed ourselves efficiently, but also have the nutritional and health benefits from that yeah. food. Whereas now it's more you're kind of sacrificing one for the other. Yeah. And um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we face with farming. And I think it, it'll be solved, but I just hope it's solved in our lifetime rather than uh, you know a few generations down the line. It's a really hopeful message that we have here. And hopefully, you know, the economic incentives at, at B um, do not hinder too much yeah. the, the progress that we all need. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Let's, let, yeah, let's hope for that. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, this has been great, Oliver. Thank you so much for giving us a tour of the farm. It's been a pleasure and a lot of fun. And uh, if people want to find more about your farm or the consulting work you do, where can they find you? So they can find us at Boston Microgreens on Instagram or at Oliver Homburg, um, O-L-I-V-E-R-H-O-M-B-E-R-G. Okay, awesome. And, awesome. Uh, 
Always happy to talk. Awesome. I'll put in the show notes. Thanks, everyone.